Well, I've taken some data of displacement <clears throat> pardon me, versus time squared, and I came up with these two equations. This blue one is my displacement equation for the data, the scatter plot, okay, all these blue points. And I found a particular slope in meters per second, uh, meters per second, excuse me, <laughs> meters per second squared, okay? And the slope of the predicted displacement is a little bit different, and it's also an acceleration. And I made equivalent the, the slope to 1 half g h over l, which is 1 half g times sine of theta. So embedded within the prediction is a value for g of 9.8 meters per second squared. Embedded within the actual data slope is another value for g that I could call g from my data. So basically I take this slope and I equate it to 1 half g h over l and solve for g and call that g of my data. Now with that g for the data, I want to ask this question. Is my g consistent with the accepted g within the confines of my measurement uncertainties? That is the question of the hour. Now to find that out, I need to sum up the relative uncertainties. Okay, because the consistency is within the confines of measurement uncertainties. There is some uncertainty in g as a ratio to g that is based upon all the measurement uncertainties that went into finding that g from the slope of the plot. A measurement was length or distance between supports. There was the height of the block that made the incline. That was the h and l for sine theta. And then we have the actual displacement of the cart down the track. And then we have the time value measured for that displacement. We can sum these relative uncertainties in order to find the relative uncertainty in g. The reason we need to sum the relative uncertainties is because this ratio of uncertainty in length divided by length is dimensionless, as is this ratio. It's a relative uncertainty of uncertainty in height divided by height, and then uncertainty in displacement divided by displacement. The reason we're doubling the uncertainty in time divided by time is because in the analysis for g, we plotted t squared on the x-axis. And if we're squaring time, it means time multiplied by time. And so we have to double the uncertainty in time. That's the rule for error propagation. So let's find out how to build all these relative uncertainties. The uncertainty in length divided by length. If we go up here, here's the distance between the legs. That's the length. So it's a one meter distance. There's the measurement uncertainty, two, mil two millimeters but I've stated it in meters, and I've justified that uncertainty by saying it's a two-point measurement with parallax. Now the relative uncertainty is simply the ratio of this uncertainty to the measurement itself. And then I multiplied it by 100% to make it more digestible. So I'd say that the measurement is one meter plus or minus 0.2%. Now the height uncertainty as a relative uncertainty is simply the uncertainty in the height found by the resolution of the vernier caliper. Take that uncertainty, divide by the measurement for, for height, and that gives us a relative uncertainty. Now I've also noted up here the uncertainty in the final position. I'll need that in just a minute. So that's five millimeters, and I get that as a one-point measurement. There was motion in the cart, and so the uncertainty was about 5 millimeters, and the measurement was 2.1 um, meters. And a quick note about sine theta. Sine theta, we can find the relative uncertainty first as a sum of relative uncertainties. So we simply add up the uncertainties of H and L as relative uncertainties, and we get 0.7%. And then we take 0.7% and multiply it by the calculation of sine theta to find out the measurement uncertainty in sine theta. And we only use one significant figure for each of these uncertainties. Now, 
scrolling down, we see that ah, my start position, various start positions, they each have an uncertainty of about 2 millimeters. I don't state a relative uncertainty, just like I didn't up here for my final position, because those are just one-point measurements on a track. Instead, we look to the displacement, or the distance, to find a relative uncertainty. What I chose to do is find the average displacement. So when I look at the data column for displacement, I have all these various measurements. They were actually calculations between start and final position. And I simply found their average. Now, if you don't have a spreadsheet and you're doing this by hand, you can just simply choose, say, the eighth trial and just analyze the eighth trial um, for your uncertainty. So you could type in 1.304 um, or type in, you're doing this by hand. So you could just write, write in, um, oh, not 1.30, 0. 0.8, excuse me, for the displacement. So I'm using 0.85 because I did a statistical average. My measurement uncertainty is simply the sum of the uncertainty in start plus the uncertainty in the final position. And that adds up to 7 millimeters. I go up here and the final position had 5 millimeters uncertainty. And the start position had 2 millimeters uncertainty. So that sums to 7. Again, I take the 7 millimeters as a meter and divide it by the 85 centimeters, using meters again, for the relative uncertainty in the displacement. Okay, And that bar above the D simply means the average D. And again, you can use 0.8 or you could use the statistical average of your displacements. So now we've built all of the relative uncertainties. And remember, we can add these up because they're each dimensionless. And when we're done adding all of these, we get the uncertainty in G divided by G. We get the relative uncertainty in G. Not the measurement, but the relative uncertainty. So now let's look at how to build the uncertainty in time divided by the average time. Again, I took an average here for the average time. So I have the average there. And I took the average of all these numbers. You can choose, again, just to use, say, the same run. Run number 8 and use this average time if you're doing this by hand. Now this, I want you to take a few minutes to calculate. This would be the uncertainty in the time measurement. And I found that value right here using the standard, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. What I did was I found the standard deviation for each trial, T1 through T3. And then down here, I averaged all those standard deviations. So to find the standard deviation, I created a new column and called it sigma sub average T. So I'm finding the standard deviation for that particular average T. And the standard deviation formula just looks like that, STDEV, and then um, it's C9 through E9, which is time 1 through time 3. And that formula is filled down, and then here's the average. But if you don't have a spreadsheet, then what I want you to do is use this formula. And do it, say, for the eighth run. Take the average time for the eighth run and subtract T1 then square that difference. Do it again for the average time in T2. Square that difference and average time in T3. Square that difference. Sum each of those differences squared up. Okay, so find the difference, square it, sum it with all the others. And then divide by 2. The number 2 because we have 3 data points. And we take n minus 1, which gives us 2. And this tells us right away that this standard deviation does not have a lot of confidence to it because we don't have a large denominator. So we'd prefer this to be 30 or 100 or 3,000. But nonetheless, it is a standard deviation. And so you can calculate that just for one run, say run number 8, and quote the average for run number 8, the measurement uncertainty, which you find from the standard deviation formula I just showed you. And then you take the relative uncertainty by finding measurement divided by, oh, excuse me, uncertainty divided by measurement. So that number is going to be doubled 
right here. And over here I have the, the formula where I'm just summing up the, the values, okay, for the relative uncertainty in height and length, and then displacement, and then twice the relative uncertainty in time. Again, these are dimensionless numbers. And I come up with 3.24% for relative uncertainty in G. Well, the G for my data was 9 meters per second squared. And I get that by taking the slope from the data, multiplying it by 2, and dividing by the sine of theta. And then if I take that 3.24% and multiply it, by 9 meters per second squared, it'll tell me that I have plus or minus 0.3 meters per second squared. Measurement uncertainty in G. So the measurement uncertainty in G is equal to the relative uncertainty in G multiplied by G itself. And by G itself, I mean from our data. And we get plus or minus 0.3 meters per second squared. Now, if I compare the accepted G, 9.8, to my data's G of 9.0, I get 8% discrepancy. So I can make this statement. My G has an 8% discrepancy from 9.8 meters per second squared, but my uncertainties only account for 3.2 of the 8%. So my G is not consistent with the accepted G within the confines of my measurement uncertainties. Now, for a graphic of what do we mean by within the confines of my measurement uncertainties, let's take a look at this graphic. Here we have a, a line, this black line, represent all the possible G's that we could have for measurement. And right here is 9.8 meters per second squared. That's the accepted G. So we mark the line with, here, there's the value for accepted G. Over here is my value that I measured, 9.0 meters per second squared. And really, that came from calculation based on lots of measurements, each containing uncertainties. And the error propagation says that my error bars around my value for g are going to be plus or minus 3%. And because this number is close to 10, that 3% kind of looks like 0.3. So I can go all the way up to 9.3 meters per second squared or all the way down to 8.7 meters per second squared. But you'll notice there's an 8% discrepancy between the accepted G and my G, which means I have about 5% discrepancy left over that I cannot account for with my measurement uncertainties. Therefore, my G is not consistent with the accepted G within the confines of my measurement uncertainties. Well, I hope that helps a little bit in your understanding of how error propagation leads us to how well we know our final value for G, and then how do we compare our value to the accepted G? How do we build those uncertainty bars?